Did you become that almost Gordon Ramsay style sort of military shouting at people? Were you that yeah. chef? Were you that guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Especially at the beginning. Mm. It, what's funny is I never intended to be that chef. You don't go into it saying, oh, I'm going to be the strict you know, chef. It just happens. You, you become that because, A, I grew up in that environment as well. You know, the, the kitchens that I worked at, so I, I made it to the CIA. I, I started working in different kitchens. I, every time I could expose myself to a Michelin star kitchen, I would do it. If it was for a day, I would go and work there for a day for free if, or a month or any amount of time. So I was going around all these kitchens and seeing a pattern. There's a level of strictness. There's a level of, you know, the, the chef has a, an, a, the ability to just control every single aspect of everything. And I wanted to be like that. I, I didn't realize I didn't have the skill set to manage people outside of a military environment yet. Mm. So I was managing as if I was still a sniper instructor, as if I'm still in the Air Force. And in reality, these are people with different goals, they're with different mindsets, and I didn't know how to take that puzzle and move it around and adjust it and be able to work my personality and my management style around it. I just didn't have that skill set. So I took a lot of heat, man. I, you know, I lost a lot of staff that looking back, I say, man, I wish I could have treated this person better or differently. Or maybe if I had the skill sets I have now, I could have given them more success in their career. But I didn't have that. I didn't have it at that time. I think it's unbelievable the fact that you've, you've took restaurants from, from a level to the top of the game. James Bade Awards, all, all that type of stuff. I think it's, you know, it, for me, mate, and this is the reason, Sal, like when I get people on here, I want people to be a master in their discipline and just doing that just kind of shows your credibility doing this. So yeah. it's unbelievable to see you clearly are dedicated to this. I mean, I can tell people who, who are not in the room right now and people who didn't, they weren't privy to the conversation we had before the podcast. Like, I can just, it oozes out of you, your love for this. And it, it's a, I, I get a massive buzz off that. Like, it inspires me to see that. So you've definitely got to just keep drilling this one because it's only going to get bigger and better for you. Yeah. I want to ask, when you say you did take these restaurants from some part, say here to the top, what does that look like? Like, when you say, do you mean you're making, you're literally turning people into millionaires? Or do you mean you're just improving their food slightly? Because I, I think there's a big spectrum where people think, yeah, you get nominated from awards, but actually how far was that compared to where yeah. it initially was? Yeah, you know, that's, that's such a good question because people think there's so many different levels of a restaurant being successful. You can be, there's some restaurants that have incredible notoriety, but don't make money. Yeah. Or if they make money, it's very minimal. And there's the opposite. There's restaurants that make a ton of money that aren't very good. So how do you define success? You know, I would say with the first restaurant, the, with my first executive chef position, I was able to elevate that restaurant in, a, in an area where food wasn't part of the culture and make it one of the best restaurants, arguably in the country at that time, in its, in its category. And What was that category? Uh, you know, we were probably a semi-casual, you know, uh, not like super high-end fine dining, but a little bit middle of the road and... The, the great thing about that place was that if, if you had your anniversary with your wife and you wanted to come in and celebrate that and feel like you were at a Michelin-style restaurant, you could do that. But if you were on a, on a Saturday afternoon, you wanted to watch a football game, American football, and with your friends or with your brother, and you want to sit at the bar and have a pizza, you can do that also. It was, very, it was a very versatile restaurant, and I was very proud of, of having that environment. So in that category of more of a casual setting – with the ability, what I what I describe as a hybrid, a hybrid fine dining restaurant, where you can have fine dining and casual at the same time, we were certainly at the top. I mean, the food was beyond most places, and the service and the wine list and cocktail programs was was top notch. I mean, it, it was definitely up there. With some how of how did you? I understand you've obviously spent years in the kitchens and stuff, but. Did, did you did you specifically do anything to upskill yourself, like looking at wine pairing and things like that? Did is it something that you're just passionate about outside of the actual thing? Like you always want to know more, coming up with different techniques. I know obviously for the people who don't know, you're actually in the northeast of England right now or <laughs> filming this podcast. I know that there's a venture um, that you that you're looking to pursue here as well. So who knows, we might all get a bit of sal in, in, in England as well. And I think, again, bringing your expertise to a place like this, I know that for me personally, right, I understand that I've did the fine dining stuff, I've, I've experienced all, all the lovely restaurants in London and, I mean, around the world, to be fair. 
But for me personally, mate, like I like a beer and a pint. Uh, yeah. I like a burger and a beer. That's genuinely like just or give us some fish and chips. Like yeah. I'm not that bothered about the finer stuff personally. Like I love it when you go to some place that could be just down the road in Sunderland and you just find some little greasy spoon but the food's mint and it's cheap and the mm. big portions I love that stuff because <laughs> I'm a proper foodie like I love a good scran yeah. so when I find them little gems like I almost don't want to tell people about them it's almost like nah that's the spot I can't do like I like that place do you know what? it's weird yeah, yeah. but everybody knows about you know the restaurant at the Shard or everybody knows about this restaurant or that rent or, or Sexy Fish or whatever the different bars and places that people go to but not everyone knows about them little hidden gems, little independent places, which is a shame for the business, I guess, because l l less people know, but I feel like they've got a touch that these chains just don't have. The yeah. stuff that I've saw on your Instagram accounts and, and things that you do look very high end now. Is that something that you sort of lean into now? I do, man. I, I've, I've fallen into that category because, mm -hmm. but not in, I don't know if intentionally it's, I've done that, but it just seems to happen where, I fall into these higher end restaurants. Like the restaurant I'm in now, uh, it's called Trey on Main. It's in this very higher end part of Indianapolis, and it's in the perfect location. It's got this incredible artwork all around it, and it's something that just sort of fell on my lap, you know. And and I embrace it. But what I do when I go into a, what's a high end place is I try to make it approachable. So someone like you who you, not everybody wants to have a Michelin star dinner every weekend. Mm -hmm. And but what you do want is Michelin style service. You yeah, want definitely. to go somewhere where you feel special. Where as soon as you walk in there, there's a different vibe to it. There's an energy that you get from going and then you try the food and it's it's familiar but it's different. You know, there's, there's little things about it that you're like, oh man, this is fish and chips, but there's something different about this fish and chips. There's a different elevation that's been, a different preparation that you know there's been thought put into this. That's what I like to create. That's that's the way I like to do fine dining now. I don't I don't think that I would, I wouldn't I won't say I won't chase a Michelin star because I think every chef dreams of having a Michelin star one day, but I now tend to lean more towards chasing the guest experience. I want the guest to have an experience where they say, oh man, I had a rough week. I had a rough day, but I went to that restaurant and it changed the way my whole perception of the week was because those two hours were so incredible for me that it doesn't matter what happened before. And that's what restaurants do that. My current, the current person I work with at Trey, he says, this is where people get to go on vacation for two hours from everything they have to deal with in life. And we have to make those two hours the best we can possibly make them for every guest. I love and I that think it's, it's great. What's your favorite food? My favorite food is Italian, man. Mm -hmm. I love Italian. And I've, I've been able to do something that I think a lot of people aren't doing, which is merge Italian food with Latin food. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you hear... A lot of Asian and Italian sort of that fusion happens quite a bit. Um, French and Italian happens quite a bit in fine dining. You see a lot of raviolis and French kitchens and things like that. I like to merge Italian with with Latin cuisine, and not a lot of people are doing that. You know? So again, it's putting your own take on these things. I want to ask you about because again, when I'm looking for restaurants, I'm looking at social media. That's the first place I'll go, and whether it may be let's just say for argument's sake, salt beer. Yeah. When you look at Nusseret, New, New when, you, when you look at these type of places, how much of, I mean, not, not necessarily that one, but places like that, which are massive on social media, they've done this mad campaign, they've got some face of the business, which are doing these crazy viral videos. How much of that has changed the way we look at food? Because for me, like, I, I've been to some, some of these restaurants, right? Yeah. And I know that, although it looks unbelievable on social media, I've had a shit experience there. Yeah. The food's just been bang average. It's just been literally quadruple the price. Like, there's just nothing about it. I'm like, give or take. Again, I'd rather go back to just having a burger or just <laughs> yeah. having a nice meal anywhere. Yeah. That's just middle of the road, some good food. You enjoy it. You get that little breakaway. There's a different experience. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's just that experience I'm looking for. But how much of social media has changed the way we look at food now and how important is that? Uh, it's so. It's one of the most important things, in my opinion, you're talking to a guy that two years ago, two and a half years ago, didn't even use Instagram. 
I mean, I didn't. I was completely against it. Very old school. Like, oh, I'm not using social media and all this thing. But what I realized was it is necessary now. That is how you get the word out on the restaurant. But it's, it hasn't changed. This is how it's been like this for years. It's just now it's social media. Before it was newspapers. Before Then it was articles, magazines, and then it was TV. It's been the same. And several chefs have said this, but the biggest thing is if you make the best food, say you make the best food in Newcastle, right? but nobody knows about it, is it the best food? You know? mm. uh, and that's, that's the battle. But it's always been, okay, you make the best food, but you can't focus on social media and all these. Or you have a great social media presence, like you say, in some of these places, but the food is average. Well, most people say that's bad, and I say there's an opportunity there. There's an opportunity to do both. Why don't you take people with skill sets, say skill sets like you, who can brand restaurants, who know how to create content that sells, and then you take people that have skill in the kitchen and you mix the two and you make it to where it's incredible online. And when you get there, it's even better. The food's better than what you saw online. You know, so the the old the, the whole thing of under promise and over deliver. So what you see online is already great, but when you get there, it's 10 times better. That's the key. That's the opportunity that, that people are key. missing. 